Okay. Okay. So again, our first uh, presenter that we have here today is Plymouth State University. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to you guys on your presentation. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So um, I'm Genevieve Pachano. I'm a grad student at Plymouth State. And today I'm presenting um, our results from the October annular eclipse. Oh, hold on. There we go. All right, so this is a map that I'm sure most people have probably seen before. Um, outlined is the path of annularity from this past October. Um, the blue dots are the atmospheric science sites. Um, the yellow dots are the engineering sites. And the purple dot in kind of central New Mexico is the atmospheric science super site. Um, so this super site consisted of five teams. Um, there are four in Moriarty, which is the blue uh, dot there, and one in Belen, which is the red dot. Um, and the purpose of the super site was to have five coordinated balloon launches per hour, which is uh, one balloon launch every 12 minutes for a total of 150 launches. All right, so like the other atmospheric science teams, um, we collected our data using balloons and radio sounds and the luft. Um, so we did 30 hourly balloon launches and the radio sounds attached to these balloons measured temperature, dew point, and pressure. And then based on GPS, um, they calculated the wind speed and direction and the height slash altitude. And then the loft, um, which was um, positioned about two meters above the ground, uh, was used to measure the temperature, relative humidity, wind speed and direction, pressure, and solar irradiance. And it recorded these variables at two second increments. So starting with some synoptic conditions, um, these are for uh, are from October 13th at 12Z. Um, at 300 hectopascals over New Mexico, you can see there's generally westerly flow. Um, at 700 um, in the same area, it's uh, from the northwest at this time. And at the surface, a cold front had just passed through the region. Um, and this is a loop showing the conditions from the 13th at 12Z through the 15th at 0Z. Um, just generally at 300, you can see the flow is uh, from the west um, with some minor variations. Um, and at 700, um, the flow is also generally from the west direction. And at the surface, after the cold front had started uh, passed through the region and started reaching the Gulf, um, a inverted trough formed over New Mexico. Um, so these are going to be surface plots um, from the entire duration of the campaign. Um, uh, this one is showing uh, solar radiation, which is shaded in orange, temperature, which is in red, and um, relative humidity, which is in purple. And if you look on the left side of this plot, um, the that's just showing look what a normal day should look like. It was the day before the eclipse. Um, and then if you look at the right side, um, the blue lines are indicating first, second, third, and fourth contact, just for some reference. Um, but the right side of this plot is um, the day of the eclipse. So as you can see, the temperature, or the solar radiation increases in the morning when the sun starts coming up. Um, and as a result, the temperature starts increasing as well. Um, and due to our uh, location and the landscape around us, um, there weren't a lot of variations in dew point. So the relative humidity for pretty much the entire uh, 30 hours was uh, primarily dependent on changes in temperature. Um, so at, in the morning when the sun came up, the relative humidity decreased and then reaching maximum annularity um, between second and third contact, um, the solar radi radiation reached a minimum and the temperature um, lagged a little bit behind this and then reached its minimum. Um, while at the same time, the relative humidity uh, kind of spiked up a little bit. Um, and then through the rest of the afternoon, as solar radiation was restored, the temperature increased throughout the rest of the day and the relative humidity decreased. Um, and this is pretty much the same plot, just adding wind um, in green. And as you can see, it's a little messy, but this is just because of the fact that the wind was not averaged. Um, so still on the day of the eclipse, um, the wind kind of followed a similar pattern to the temperature where it increased in the morning. Um, however, at first contact, it started decreasing until um, maximum annularity um, when it was pretty much just cut off. And then throughout the rest of the afternoon, it stayed pretty calm until there's this sudden increase uh, towards the end of the period. Um, and this is just looking at the um, day of the eclipse, just 
the daytime values just to look at it in a little bit higher resolution. Um, the bars in red that are at the bottom of the plot are indicating where the net radiation balance is negative. And um, this means that there's more long wave radiation leaving um, the earth than there is short wave radiation from the sun coming in. And where the bars are green is where the net radiation balance is positive, which means that the long wave radiation leaving is less than the short wave radiation coming in. Um, and just to kind of summarize some of the actual values from this plot, um, the solar radiation dropped 346 watts per meter squared in one hour and 13 minutes. Uh, the temperature dropped uh, 1.2 degrees Celsius in 40 minutes, and this lagged behind the solar minimum by six minutes. The relative humidity increased by uh, th uh, 3.1% in 31 minutes, and this lagged the solar minimum by nine minutes. And last, the wind speed dropped about three meters per second in an hour and 18 minutes, uh, which lagged the solar minimum by six and a half minutes. So this is a plot showing uh, the wind direction and speed from, again, the day of the eclipse. Um, the wind direction is uh, indicated by each dot's position on the y-axis, and its color is in, or, uh, the color indicates the wind speed. Um, so as you can see, there's quite a few interesting features on this plot, which we're going to go into a little bit more uh, depth on. So starting with this red shaded region here, um, the, uh, the sun's position relative to our location was um, pretty much just to the southeast. Um, and this resulted in preferential heating occurring on the slopes to uh, our like west, northwest. Um, and when this happens, the air on those slopes is warmed a little more than the environment. So it's you know just generally warmer, which causes it to rise, um, resulting in air from the surrounding areas to flow towards the slopes to kind of fill it back in. Um, and this resulted in the observed wind um, direction that we saw um, from the southeast. Uh, moving forward a little bit, um, the sun is now being blocked out uh, pretty well by the moon because we're past first contact. Um, and it's a little further in the sky, uh, south in the sky. So the preferential heating uh, slopes were shifted um, to the uh, northwest of our location, to those uh, slopes in that terrain, um, which for the same reason resulted in a south southeasterly wind at that time. Um, and then moving on to maximum annularity, um, the sun is now pretty uh, mostly blocked out um, by the moon. So um, there wasn't really preferential heating going on at this time, but due to the fact that the slopes to our west were preferentially heated for the longest duration of time before that, the um, the air on those slopes was still a little warmer than the environment. Um, so again, for the same reason, we saw a east uh, or south southeasterly wind at this time. And then after fourth contact, uh, the sun is now um, pretty much due south, and the wind was from the uh, north. Um, and I'm not too sure why this happened. Um, there's a lot of complex terrain in this area, which is likely influencing this, which I don't know too much about because I'm from the Northeast. Um, so I'll look a little bit more into this at another time. And then towards the end of the period, there's a really uh, rapid increase in wind speed and a pretty clear change in direction. Um, however, at this time, the sun was in the Southeast um, relative to our position. But the wind was from the west, which doesn't quite follow this preferential heating pattern that I established before. Um, but if we look to the west, um, there was pretty substantial terrain with ridge lines between 2100 and 2700 meters above sea level. Um, and these uh, mountain ridge lines are um, indicated by the bracket on the skew T. So the image on the right is a skew T plot. Um, and just above the ridge lines is uh, just for a reference point is 700 hectopascals. And if you look just above that, there's a capping inversion um, from uh, starting at the beginning of the um, skew T loop, which is just before the start of the increased wind speed. Um, and as the time um, progresses, um, the higher winds that were above the capping inversion um, are mixed down towards the surface, resulting in the higher wind speed that we saw as well as drier air um, being mixed down. Um, and these are typical profiles for downslope wind events. 
So just to summarize, approaching maximum annularity, um, there was a decrease in solar radiation. We also saw just the trends that we expected to see in surface variables, such as the decrease in temperature, the increase in solar radiation, and the decrease in wind speed. And also the changes in wind direction occurred as a result of mountain slopes being preferentially heated, the complex terrain, and downslope winds. And with that, I can take any of your questions. All right, thank you. And that was perfectly timed, by the way, so. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Um, I have a question, and that is, this presentation was based on the data from five different groups, because right? Um, so this was just from um, like the data we collected. We had two teams at this, of the um, four teams in Moriarty. Um, I just used our data. I just wanted to mention that the super site there just to kind of give some context, not necessarily for my work, but just. So if you used all five teams, you could potentially have higher resolution even than you showed, right? Um, I mean, we had, so the luft, like we just had five or uh, five luft, or I guess four, cause we we're, there's only four teams on that field, but we had four lufts in the same location. So it wouldn't really be higher resolution cause they're all within a hundred yards of each other. Um, but if we, um, if we, I guess if we had positioned them maybe a little further apart and like put someone's left a little further away, we probably could have gotten a little better like spatial resolution, but yeah. Any other questions? Don't see anything in the chat. I'll try another uh, one. If there... oh, can I try another question? Okay, go ahead, were you surprised by anything yeah, you saw? Yeah, then? go ahead. Um, I wouldn't say we were surprised by any like the variables we saw. Um, I guess the most surprising thing was honestly just how dry it was because you can prepare all you want, but when you're actually out there, it was ridiculously dry. Okay. Well, with that, thank you so much uh, for the presentation, and uh, we'll give there's, there's you one, all a big. Uh, Matthew, oh. one more. I think we have oh, yeah, one more question. Could you, yep. could you, could you catch catch the chat question? Yep, I can. Uh, this is from Angela. Um, do you expect different results in April? Um, I would expect the results to probably be a little more extreme, considering the solar radiation is being completely cut off in April. But our teams are going to northern New Hampshire. Um, I'm optimistic it's not going to be cloudy, but it's likely going to be cloudy. So I guess we wouldn't quite see as um, extreme of effects just due to the fact that it's cloudy. Very good. All right. Thank you. And with that, I think we are pretty much out of time. So again, thank you so much. We'll give you a big virtual round of applause for that. Thank you. Thanks.